a remote control socket, a faulty remote control socket sent by Ian. So this is a GSGS Designs PLC um, unit and it says max 13 amp resistive load frequency 433.92 megahertz. And what's happening when this is plugged in and he says it happens with both, both the remote and the button the side. I think the button the side was the only bit that was left so kind of working. Do you see how it's glowing that orange colour? When I press this green button the side, the orange I hear the relay click and it goes blue, and then it immediately reverts back. Press the button again, nothing. It's just not having anything at all. Oh. Keep pressing. Nope, nothing's happening. Right, okay. I can guess what's up. Can you guess what's up? Let's open it and find out. Uh, the type of screws in this are the cross blade, flat blade screw, but it's the ones that are anti-tamper. Extra challenge. So, um... I'm going to have to crack out my little anti-tamper set here. Um, there it is. To get this open. This little screwdriver set, I'm not even sure what brand it is. I got it a while back and it probably had a label on the packaging. I think it might even have come out of TK Maxx. They just seem to occasionally appear every so often. So my guess is that this has a capacitive dropper, most of them do. And that the capacitor inside the X2 capacitor has gone low value. It's basically just degraded over time. And there's one way to test that, and that's to pop the lid open. And if it's accessible, because it's not always accessible in these units, if we can get access to the capacitor to measure it, we'll measure it in situ. If not, we'll try and get the circuit board out, although hopefully it's not glued in. Many of them are. So we're almost there. Four screws hold the base on. It may be clipped as well. We'll find out when we lift the top. It's just going to pop apart. So we've got... Uh... Oh, that's in two bits. Oh, right, okay, this is a plastic trim that's swap. I wonder if that's for colour coding. Or maybe even for adjustment in the, the design. Ooh. Is this going to pop apart? No, it's not. There is the classic British shutter mechanism that when I... Put this plug in, you'll see the shutters that are covering the pins will uh, slide down, or should slide down, but uh, might not go so, or should I say up the way, in fact. There we go, to let the other pins in. That is just begging for that to just pop apart if I do that. Let's try not to do that. That's our safety mechanism. There's the relay. There's the capacitor. That is a really odd antenna. Can you see that sort of big loop of wire and a sort of semi-spiral? It's, it's basically just one loop. The Let's uh, get down a little tiny bit closer to this. The relay has a thermal fuse on the side with this hard cement, so it's stuck on there. Uh, and the point of that is that it will be in series with the control circuit by the look of it because it's quite thin wires or is it taking the full load? I doubt it would take the full load because it's quite big wires and if that uh, really overheats, if the contact starts burning up inside it, that will kill the circuitry here's the bit we're interested in though, this is the dropper capacitor let's bring the meter in and measure it, what's it supposed to be? it says 0.22k 275 volts AC X2. So it's a suppression capacitor that's been used as a drop capacitor. 0.22K means it's 220 nanofarad. Let's uh, set this to 2 microfarad, or 2000 nanofarad. And let's probe that and see if it's still anywhere remotely near 220 nanofarad. Uh, 47 nanofarad is not even remotely near. So that is the prime suspect here. And what's most likely been happening is that when you turn it on, it's got enough power to make the LEDs like this LED here that lights up orange and blue, which is quite nice. Um, it's got enough power to charge the capacitor up to the level that it can light that. But when you click the button, the relay draws so much current that this can't keep up the current required and the capacitor slowly discharges until the relay just clunks back out again. So I'm going to go and look and see if I can find some capacitors. I'll get the soldering iron on um, and we'll see if we can get this out actually. Let's try and get it out first. I don't think it's screwed in. Oh, I can see some glue. That's not nice. I don't like things that are glued. 
Let's see if I can break this off with a spudger. Oh, I think there's glue over at the other side as well. Or a screwdriver. That might work better. Let's try it pushing this in without damaging anything. Is that going to help get it out? Uh, maybe not. And also the wires will be holding it in place. I'm lifting the relay here. I could potentially damage the relay if I use too much force. That is annoying that it's kind of glued in. I can get why they glued it in. How is it held down in the first place? I think it's held in by this little pin here will push down on the circuit board. Right, tell you what, I'll pause. I shall see if I can find the capacitor. If this doesn't come out easily, we'll maybe try and get it out from the top. I don't know if this is going to work. And I try and repair it from the top without taking this circuit board out. Although, to be honest, it'd be nice to see what's inside. Right, tell you what, I'm going to pause while I look for capacitors and get the soldering iron on. I have my tub of capacitors, I have the unit out. I kind of overthought that a bit. It turns out that you can get the unit out quite easily by pushing the pins at the back. I think I was actually holding the pins and then trying to pull the unit out. The correct answer was just to shove it out from the back and the whole lot comes out. It's out now. It reveals a little chip. And for those of you who lack the numbers, it's an MDT 10P611S12. It's a fairly generic little microcontroller. And that suggests that the circuitry around here, associated with the antenna, is probably just a very simple tuned circuit based on the discrete transistors here. The other chip is this little eight pin chip, which has absolutely got a terrible mark on it. I couldn't read it. But I can see that all the pins at this end are common, and there's a couple of pins going to the chip. That pretty much means it's a serial memory chip, and it means that it will be able to actually store the code for the uh, unit in that. But this is a bit we're interested in here. It's this capacitor. Other things worthy of note. They have, across this capacitor, they have a couple of tiny little resistors, very, very tiny surface mount resistors. Um, that's good in a way, because uh, the, each resistor has a value of 120k. 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, and 4 zeros. Not sure if you're even going to see that. And uh, that means that they've got a total combined value about 250k. But there's two in series, and they, those are the discharge resistors across that uh, capacitor. I might have gone for a slightly higher value, I might have gone for bigger capacitors. There's plenty of room in here to do that. But uh, bigger resistors, should I say. But uh, the other uh, advantage of this over other units is quite often they just have very, one very small resistor just to tick the box in there. And in some un units that can cause problems. Right, but anyway, I digress. Let's get this out. So I'm going to fold this resistor up. I'm not going to fold this resistor up. It's refusing to fold up. Let's heat one of the solder joints. I don't think this is a fairly new unit. I could be wrong. Maybe it's uh, got lead-based solder. Maybe not. It looks too shiny to be lead-based, uh, lead-free solder. And let's uh, heat the other terminal here and get the other leg out of that capacitor. This also has big solder connections going in. So I may have to flow some fresh solder on and just give this a bit of welly for a while to get that to melt. That's looking better. It's out. I also have to be careful to make sure that's not connected to the thermal fuse, but I think the thermal fuse here, it's connected a couple of wires over here. They seem to be tied into what looks like the transistor that switches it. It looks as though that is the bit that uh, basically just it kills the it looks like it's between the transistor and the relay, so that's probably the bit that kills it if it does actually start overheating. Right. Here is my capacitor I've pulled out. Let's test it now it's out and see if it affects the reading, because the resistors can affect the reading away. We're looking for 220 nanofarad. We're still getting 47 nanofarad. That's rubbish. It's a quarter of its value. These things, uh, these capacitors degrade. They're based on metalized film, and inside, if you unroll them, it looks like a couple of thin ribbons of flimsy polythene or polyethylene type plastic with a metalized coating on them, much like the sort of reflective mylar you'd find. And when you actually look at them, you can see if you unravel it, it should be a solid mirror type effect, but it looks mottled. It always looks a bit sort of faded out and you can see through it and that's what causes degradation of the capacitance volume. The nearest capacitors I have to that 
No, that's not that's way too big. Most of them have short pins. These are uh, just 220 nanofarad X2 capacitors. This one has long pins. Is this Connec? Not sure. Uh, and these ones are the closest matching. I think these are Suntan. So I'm going to use one of these. Uh, yes, they are Suntan. Oh, is this branded in any way? Not obviously. Right, I'll use one of these. 220 nano, 275 volts AC. Right here, let's fix it. So I'll put the spare one back in here. I shall put my components back in the tub and then tuck that out the way because it's not needed. I shall leave the ratings pointing up the way and just bend these leads down in a rather uncouth manner. And then I shall take the solder off those pads with desoldering wick. Here is some desoldering wick. Let's add a little tiny dab of flux. I look for my flux pen. There is my flux pen. We'll add one femtopol of flux onto this braid. Just to make it uh, moister. The way this desoldering braid works is that when you... Uh, it's basically just copper braid. And it wants to suck the solder into it, and adding a bit of flux there helps. I'm just trying to remember where that capacitor was. There we go, that's that lead there. So what's happening is that as the solder melts, the preferred surface to go into is this large surface area braid. This might be a bit harder with this bit, because this is a big solder joint. That is a very big solder joint. This may not work. I shall try my best. Oh, there it's worked. There we go, that's good. And now I shall pop this capacitor through from the other side. Uh, things worthy of note. The capacitive dropper has a full bridge rectifier underneath it, full bridge rectifier, and a Zener diode, or Zener diode, which caps the voltage. It's a simple power supply, smoothing capacitor, and then a bit of maybe voltage regulation. I'm guessing this is a regulator in here, this, this little transistor type device, and then that's feeding the microcontroller and circuitry. So we'll pop this in. Like that. Stick it down against the diodes, because they don't really get that hot, and uh, we shall solder that. And then, theoretically, if I put this back together, it should work. Maybe it won't work. Maybe I'll just make a fool of myself. You'll be seeing either way what happens. If you want, you can skip forward to see if it works. I don't mind people skipping through my videos. That's how YouTube works. Other things worthy, worthy of mention are that if you, if English isn't your native language, you can still leave comments in your native language down below. I'm fine with that. That is also how YouTube works. I'm going to place this back in now. Oh, look at that little, uh, what is that for? What's that little um, pad? What lines up with that? These two solder pads line up with that. Not sure what they're for. I'm just going to take a closer look at those. I don't know. I'm not sure what that's for at all. Must be some, maybe another function? Don't know. Weird manufacturer quirks. Maybe something that's done to program it before, or power it to test it before they actually put this label on, because the label actually covers that hole. That's odd. Let's sit this back into place. Oh, that sat in quite nicely. Is the circuit board going to sit down comfortably? Uh, it's, it's not. This is uh, one of the worst things about these circuit boards, these uh, units that have such close-fitting circuitry. I don't want to lift the components too hard. I don't want to damage anything. Does this hook in in any particular way? I can turn the solder on off at home. I shall do that. Uh, it's got little ramps here, but nothing that looks as though it's going to grip it. I think it may just purely be a friction fit. Okay, friction fit it is then. 
I shall mush that down. I think that's actually mushed down. Let's get this bit into position. And this contact in, this is the, the neutral is just linked straight through here, but it's the live that's switched, so the live has got a separate uh, pin connection and the socket connection here. I shall just gently grip this and use these to guide that in. And then I shall, oh, I shall put this on, that's kind of important. And then, I wonder how you program this. I would guess that you hold that button in and it puts it, if you hold it in long enough, it puts it into a programming mode. I'm not really sure. Let's put this thing on here. And then this on here. Should I really be putting it all back together again before I test it? Well, the answer is yes, just in case it goes boom. Things do rarely go boom in the channel. A lot of you say this is not good enough. You want things to go boom. I can make things go boom. I really should make more things go boom. Especially when I've got more than enough explosives to blur the shit out of stuff. Let's put this down here. Two screws, good enough at the moment. Yeah. All I want to see at the moment is whether, when I plug this in, that orange indicator is brighter now. When I press this, I heard it click. And I didn't hear it click off. The unit is fixed. And that's all it takes, and to be honest, these uh, units, did you notice how I put my finger over the contacts there just to check if there is a discharge resistor? This is a really common problem with these simple things. I've actually just thought of a way that would be quite useful to test these. By showing you 220 nanofarad is pretty much just enough for the relay. It's passing just enough current for the relay and the uh, capacitive dropper. Many other units have a higher value of capacitor, like 330 or even 470 nano or bigger. And they all, because they use capacitive dropper, the power factor is absolutely awful. What that means is the, the capacitive dropper is basically deriving a 24 volt supply from a 240 volt supply in our case. So typically you'd see it would be something like a 10% power factor, 0.1. Let's find out. Let's bring the hop in and plug that in and just see what a healthy unit looks like. Oh, I'm going to have to use a death adapter to lift this up. Uh, where is my death adapter? Just to get that higher. Oh, one moment, I've not got a shortage of those. I shall just grab a death adapter from the pile. I shall plug that in there and plug this in there. So, it's drawing 16 milliamps. The power factor is indeed around about 0 0.1, 0 0.14. Uh, ambient power consumption is 0.5 watts, but because uh, of the power factor, it typically it means that it's going to be more like uh, 5 watts if it, you, they measured for apparent power, which will happen in the future. And if I turn the relay on, does it change? Uh, 21 amps is wrong. This... Meter has been crashing quite a lot recently. It doesn't like glitching. That's pretty odd. Is that just since I opened it? The current hasn't really changed. And the power. Okay. So that's it fixed. That's good. And we can see that it's drawing roughly about 16 milliamps. I would guess... Oh, you know what I could have done? Oh, no, I can't, because uh, I'd have had to test it with this in circuit. Otherwise, the, I was going to put this into the hoppy and just see what sort of current it was passing on its own at 47 nanofarad, but, of course, the hoppy just refuses to show just pure capacitor uh, leakage. It's just uh, beyond a certain, certain power factor. It just shuts off. So that's it fixed. It's just a fairly standard fault, and I have to say, as these things go, that one was quite easy to change capacitor in. And now I'm going to have some... Indeed. Yes, I am. I'm going to have some what's left of the Gylian chocolates that uh, Christopher sent, plus also the last sweet lotus. I didn't realise it was lotus. Susie Goffre de Liège Luxe Waffle. Uh, basically a sweet waffle.
And I'm going to eat that right now. Yeah, seriously, I've, I've decimated these. There's not many shells. These are the ones that they basically paint the mould with chocolate first, and then they pour the other chocolate and stuff into it. Quite interesting. I'd like to see the factory actually making these because they seem to be really mass produced. But uh, yeah, that's that fixed. I'm about to have the candy. That's it. So I uh, hope you found this useful. hope you can use it to fix similar type devices. And uh, that's it. Good result.